Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Corinne, and I will be your moderator. Tonight's webinar is a part of our Breaking Down Barriers series, and our mission is to shine light on areas of dentistry that are overlooked by many and increase awareness to help achieve optimal oral health care, which is a critical component to achieving good overall health. We are excited to welcome Dr. David Resnick as our speaker tonight for part two of treating patients living with HIV. If during the webinar you have questions, please drop them into the Q&A section of your control panel and we will answer them live at the end of Dr. Resnick's presentation. And lastly, we are offering CE credit for attending tonight's webinar. If you are interested in CE, please click on the CE available icon and fill out the survey. We will also send out a post-webinar email that contains the CE link, as well as the recording of tonight's webinar. Should you have any questions about CE, please email webinars at henryshine.com. All right, let's get the show on the road. Dr. Resnick, thank you so much for participating in this series and covering tonight's topic. I'll hand it on over to you. Well, thank you, Corinne. It's a pleasure to be back and presenting on a disease that I have been working in for well over 30 years. Um, about a month ago, we covered part one, which were some treatment considerations. Today, we're going to go into the part where we talk about more of the oral manifestations that are seen in association with HIV, as there are no oral lesions that are just diagnostic of HIV. So I want to get that point across before we go. So at the end of today's presentation, I want the audience to be aware of the most common oral manifestations that we do see in association with HIV and understand the role that we as oral health care professionals have in diagnosing these lesions, treating these lesions, and if they're showing up, referring them to primary care. Because if you have an undetectable viral load, your HIV is well controlled, you really shouldn't have any of the lesions that I'm getting ready to talk about tonight. So one thing is if you have um, an Apple device or iOS, everything that I'm going to talk about tonight is literally coming from this app. And so uh, you have, not only we have access to the presentation, but you'll have access not just to my slides, but to the entire um, gamut of information covered in both the lectures one and two. So it's a little bit of a bonus there. So what about these oral manifestations? Um, they have been around since the beginning. Oral um, pathologists, oral medicine people were amongst the first people to look at these lesions back in the 1980s. Um, we've seen a significant decrease. When I first started working at um, Grady Hospital, Grady Memorial um, uh, Hospital, almost every patient that came in had some form of an oral lesion that prior to my experience with HIV, I had barely seen any of. So for instance, whereas the most common oral lesion we see today is oral candidiasis, and I have a picture of that on the, on the screen, I might have seen one or two cases before I started working with people who have HIV disease. But now we really don't see these lesions as often, especially in patients who are well controlled. But there are about half of the people in the United States with HIV who are not well controlled, who very well might show up to your office for routine dental care. And so these are some things that I want to get across, so maybe it'll make it easier to manage, easier to make sure that we're getting the best outcomes for those that we serve. So what are some of the factors that we see uh, that make it uh, predisposed expression? A CD4 count less than 200. For those not as familiar with HIV, that means that you have an AIDS diagnosis. I mean, there are other ways that you can get an AIDS diagnosis, but a CD4 count less than 200 is one of the big ones. A viral load greater than 3,000 copies. Our goal is to have undetectable viral load because if you have undetectable viral load, you cannot sexually transmit this infection. Dry mouth is another reason that we might see more oral lesions, poor oral hygiene and smoking. And smoking is, smoking cessation is something we really need to offer those of our patients who do smoke. In this particular disease state, smoking is the major modifiable death risk factor. So if we can get our patients to stop smoking, they will live longer. 
Um, and as I've said at the very beginning, there are no lesions that are diagnostic of HIV. There we go. So let's talk about some of the fungal infections. The first is angular chelitis. And we all know that there's multiple reasons that a person could show up with angular chelitis, whether it's um, nutritional deficiencies or um, overclosure, or, you know, a reduced vertical dimension of occlusion. But it does show up more frequently in this patient population. It will present as cracking or fissuring at the corners of the mouth. We do diagnosis based on clinical presentation. There's no special staining or test that needs to be done. And then the way we manage it is using a topical antifungal cream or ointment applied directly to the lesions four times a day for about two weeks. So it's just putting a little ketoconazole in the corners of your mouth and be done with it. So this is something that we see both in older people who have lost their vertical dimension of occlusion and people with uncontrolled HIV disease. The next area I want to talk about is erythematous candidiasis. It is probably the most misdiagnosed or most underdiagnosed oral lesion that we see in association with HIV. It presents as a red, flat, subtle lesion either on the dorsal surface of the tongue and or the hard palate. Patients will complain that their mouth burns or their tongue burns, especially when having salty or spicy foods or beverages. So that's one of the things that we can tell. It is a fungal infection, so it is actually a kissing lesion. If you were to culture this under, or put it under a KOH um, stain, what you would see are more blastospores, not as many pseudohyphae. So if you just look at the lesion on the hard and soft palate, it could be other things. It could be pizza burn, the very common thing that almost all of us have done at one point. And the picture on the left, when I was in dental school, we referred to this as median rhomboid glossitis, meaning that it was in the middle of the tongue. We sort of knew the shape of it, and it was inflammation. But now we know that the cause of this is, for the most part, um, candida albicans. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea of what we see. But since this is a fungal lesion, if you do see something on the dorsal surface of the tongue, please look at the hard and soft palate to see if you see this kissing lesion. It will definitely make it easier to diagnose. You can also see this under dentures as denture stomatitis. If you have a patient that has a removable uh, prosthesis, and they have any form of, of oral candidiasis. It's very important that we not only treat the oral lesion, but we treat the denture or the partial as well. Because we did a large study of 213 patients. We looked in the periodontal sulcus, we cultured the lesions. And one of the things that we found was that the denture was able, denture acrylic was actually able to grow candida in some of the more resistant strains. So that's an important point to bring home. They're also put different things into your diagnosis. Um, this is awfully far back because this could be erythematous candidiasis, which it, is what it is, or it could be something such as trauma. I'll go over treatment because I base treatment on erythematous candidiasis. We're always going to use a topical. There are, whereas it can show up anywhere in the oral cavity, it is a limited mild infection. But when we talk about pseudomembranous candidiasis, I try to break up treatment based on the extent of the disease. So for instance, if you look at the vibrating line, the junction of the hard and soft palates, anything anterior, a topical will work. Anything past that, you're going to need a systemic therapy. Topicals work by coming into contact with the candidal plaques and disrupting cell function. And so they need to stay in contact long enough for it to work. So that's one of the points that I think is really important. These are moderate to severe cases of pseudomembranous candidiasis where topical really isn't going to make any difference. Um, basically, it's not going to stay in contact with the lesions in the posterior a soft palate long enough or on the uvula long enough. And if you have a broad spectrum infection, it also, you not, you'll need a systemic um, medication, the most common one, which is fluconazole. So let's take a look at some of the treatment options that we do have. And those are some of the examples, again, from the app that we have on the top of the screen. But there are two very common topical antifungals that are used. 
The most common uh, topical antifungal used in the United States is nystatin oral suspension. Um, if you have an old copy of a PDR, it would tell you that people need to swish with one teaspoon in the mouth for two to five minutes, four times a day for two weeks. We really have a hard time getting our patients to brush their teeth for two minutes twice a day. So imagine if you had to do this four times a day. The other thing is nystatin has a very high sucrose concentration. The number one unmet need for people with HIV oral health need is dental care. And so we, if we have patients who have caries or are beginning to get caries, uh, soaking your mouth in uh, basically a sugar suspension is not going to be very helpful. Nystatin also comes with the directions to swish and swallow. This is a topical medication which actually has no benefit by swallowing. It is not going to be in the esophageal area long enough as you swallow. Have you ever seen a swallow study? It's almost instantaneous. So it's not going to be in contact with the plaques long enough to make a difference. There is a sugar-free version of nystatin oral suspension. Um, I've said this in many lectures. I tasted it in the Association of Nurses and AIDS Care Conference in 1999 in San Antonio, Texas. One of the worst things I have ever put in my mouth. There is a reason that there's so much sugar in nystatin. So as you can tell, it's not my favorite product but it is the most common product written in the United States. And if you look at the PDR now, it says swish as long as possible. So we are in an instant gratification, texting, instant messaging society. So we really need to stress to our patients, if you are using that, keep it in the mouth at least a minute. Try to swish it around for two minutes and then expectorate. There is absolutely no reason to swallow this. The other topical, the second most common topical is clotrimazole. And this is you dissolve a lozenge once in the mouth five times a day. And that also, again, is a challenge. So if I have a patient who might be homeless or I have a patient who might have some significant, say, mental health or substance use barriers that are going to prevent them from doing something five a day, I might write a systemic therapy, which is once a day. But back to clotrimazole, it's a lozenge. So the way I used to tell people how you do this five times a day is after breakfast, after lunch, after Oprah, after dinner, and before you go to bed. But then Oprah went off television, so then it was Ellen or Judge Judy. So what you're trying to do is find something that'll work for the patient. That's the most important part. For systemic therapies, as I mentioned, it's fluconazole, and you take two on day one, followed by one tab the rest of the time for 14 days or two weeks. Some folks say 10 days, some folks say 14 days. I tend to be in the 14-day category because I want to get the colony-forming units reduced as much as possible to prevent recurrence. For esophageal candidiasis, and how do you tell if something is esophageal? Um, well, the number one symptom that you'll hear from your patients is, I'm having difficulty swallowing. I'm having a difficult time taking my pills. I'm having a difficult time swallowing food. They'll feel like something is stuck. So if that is your first uh, clue that the patient has esophageal uh, candidiasis. And then treatment there is a little bit different. You start off with a higher dose. It's 200 milligrams. So you start with 400 milligrams on day one and then 200 milligrams for a two-week period of time. Drug interactions are minimal. But there is there are some interactions. If you have some patients who are still on warfarin, that is an interaction. So always look at your, your drug interactions when you're writing something like this. But for the most part, it's very easy to take, does not cause GI distress, and it really is an excellent medication that we've had around for, for decades now. Oral hairy leukoplakia is the other white lesion. It's a white lesion on the lateral border of the tongue that will not wipe away. The issue with candidiasis is you can wipe these lesions away and sometimes you will see a red or bleeding surface. So candidiasis, you can wipe away oral hairy leukoplakia. You cannot wipe away. It's related to the Epstein-Barr virus, but it is not oncogenic. 
As a matter of fact, this is the first lesion that was literally studied in this patient population. Um, a dermatologist uh, from San Francisco did the first biopsy, and John and Deborah Greenspan did the research on it. And one of the first findings before we had, you know, this fabulous therapy that we have today that reduces the viral load to undetectable levels is if you presented with this back before therapy, you had X number of months to live. Very depressing kind of finding when you would see it. Now, when I see it, my first thought is that they are failing their antiretroviral therapy. And we don't see that as much as we used to, but we still see people of failing therapy. Remember that the mouth is the window to the rest of the body. So that's why soft tissue exams are so very important. I remember when I got out of school with all the, what I thought was a lot of uh, debt, student debt, um, compared to what uh, students are living with today, I guess it wasn't all that much. But if there was endo that needed to be done on tooth number 30, I might immediately look at tooth number 30. Um, now, and all my residents get trained this, my hygienists get trained, all of my faculty. The first thing we do, yes, we're going to ask, ask them what their chief complaint is, but we're going to do a thorough head and neck exam on every patient every time they appear. So again, this is just a sign that it might be that the patient is failing therapy. It is not only seen in this patient population, um, there was a study that looked at people who had the clinical pathologic features, about 35 patients who did not have HIV infection. 28 patients had um, respiratory problems requiring long-term steroid inhaler use. One of the things that our medical colleagues sometimes forget to tell our patients is if they're using long-term steroid inhalers to please rinse out afterwards. Four suffered from autoimmune diseases requiring immunosuppressant therapy, and four had diabetes. So what are some of the causes that a patient could show up with candidiasis, a lesion we talked about earlier? It's not just HIV. It could be uncontrolled or undiagnosed um, uh, diabetes. It could be that somebody is using a steroid inhaler and using it incorrectly. But these are things that we can correct when we see our patients. That's, again, the mouth is, is going to show the reflection of the rest of the body. Kaposi sarcoma. This is the most common oral cancer still that we see in this patient population. But for years, I had taken it out of my presentations. And predominantly because I just wasn't seeing it any longer. And so why would I want to teach my dental colleagues about Kaposi sarcoma if we weren't seeing it? But as you can tell from this slide, I had three cases in one week. All were 24 years of age or younger. Two of three were non-compliant with their HIV medications. We do know that the causative agent is human herpes virus number eight or KS herpes virus. So we do know the cause. This was the easiest biopsy I have ever done. Early on during the course of HIV, I would literally treat some of these lesions with intralesional injections of a chemotherapeutic agent, then blastin. Now, when a patient comes in and we do the oral diagnosis and we, and we do a lot of the diagnosing of, of Kaposi sarcoma, patient goes on systemic therapy and chemotherapy and we just cover the whole nine yards. So you to actually present with Kaposi sarcoma, you usually need to have two things going on, a detectable viral load and human herpes virus number eight. If you can get the viral load undetectable, we really shouldn't see that. But this case that I'm showing you is actually someone who had um, good treatment, but they had a, a reaction to a new agent, and there was an overreaction causing the Kaposi sarcoma to present. Treatment involves uh, antiretroviral therapy and um, uh, chemotherapy. And if you look at the different examples, it can be red, it can be flat, it can be raised, it can be nodular, it can show inside of the mouth, on the lips, anywhere on the face. It has a tendency to show up on the nose, intraorally, in the groin areas and around the ankles. So there are several different areas that, that this will present. 
Uh, one of the cases we diagnosed was in summer and the person had on shorts and we noticed the lesions on the ankles. So again, we look, we don't just treat mouths, we treat the entire person. And this gives us another way to diagnose a vascular neoplasm, get them referred to primary care or to oncology and get them on the road to health. And these are things that happens all the time. Diagnosis of this is on a biopsy. There is one lesion that sort of looks like it, and that's Bartonella or cat scratch fever. Don't see that very often, but we still recommend that you biopsy this lesion for a definitive diagnosis. So some lesions, you can do an excisional biopsy. Some lesions, you're just doing a partial biopsy to get the diagnosis and let the primary care and oncology team go from there. Oral health is very important at this point. On the slide that I previously showed you, when you see these, these, uh, inter, these papilla lesions, cleaning them, although it might be a little bit messy, actually is one of the steps to get the inflammation down and get the person on the road to healing. So yes, I will clean these areas. Um, a lot of times I'll do this by hand just because it's a bit messy. And I actually did this biopsy as I was cleaning the patient up. So, I mean, I think everybody on this call that's licensed to do so could do that. this biopsy. It was so simple. As we move on, let's talk about periodontal disease. So periodontal disease, uh, we also know about necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. But one of the things that was unique to this disease early on, but it's still seen in other disease states, is necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis. It presents as, oh, well, before we get to that question, I do have a question for the audience. I don't have a poll going, but I want you to think of this statement. Which of the following statements is true? It is safe to use a high-speed ultrasonic scaler on a person with an AIDS diagnosis, or two, it is not safe to use a high-speed ultrasonic uh, scaler on a person with an AIDS diagnosis. The answer is it's perfectly safe. And the reasoning is that this is actually not that other disease. This is not COVID. This is a blood-borne pathogen, and aerosols are very small in diameter. And, and to be frankly honest, uh, there have been no evidence that power, dental, or surgical instruments can generate aerosols containing infective blood-borne pathogens. That means we still wear our full PPE, we wear our shields, we wear our masks, we have our gloves, our gowns, the whole nine yards, but there is no risk of transmission of HIV via um, using a high-speed ultrasonic scaler. Now, we do know that we are taking airborne precautions these days. So I assume that every patient that comes in, if you followed any of our COVID and dentistry webinars, I assume that every patient who walks in my office today has COVID. I actually know that everyone who walks into my office today has HIV, but I assume that they may have COVID, so we're wearing our fit-tested N95s, we're wearing our shields, we're wearing our gowns, we're properly disposing of them afterwards, et cetera, et cetera. So creating an aerosol and, and a person with HIV is no big deal but we still have to worry about that other little pandemic that's been going around for two and a half years now. Severe periodontitis is more common in this patient population. There was a study that looked at the prevalence and severity of periodontitis in 258 HIV-infected patients versus 539 controls. Severe periodontitis was much more prevalent in the HIV a positive population than in controls, 66% versus 36%. So that is a very significant finding. HIV infection, increasing age, and male gender were significant risk factors for severe periodontitis. It's important to know that in many parts of the country, that over half of the patients or people living with HIV are over 50 years of age. So many of them that survived the early days are doing well. They are more at risk for severe periodontal disease. But we actually treat a patient as an individual. So I have a lot of patients who are older, 
even older than me, who come in that have HIV infection, that have had it for a very long time, um, but we place their recall based on whatever their need is. So we have some wonderful patients with fabulous dental uh, oral hygiene that we see twice a year for preventive care. We have some that already had advanced periodontal disease, so we keep them on periodontal maintenance care. But I'm not going to say that everybody with HIV that's a male that's over 50 needs to be seen four times a year. What we do is we base it on um, the individual. But we should be aware of the increased prevalence of periodontitis associated with HIV infection among patients and healthcare professionals could significantly improve oral health and quality of, age, of life for this patient population if we recognize this and we do what we can to save as many teeth as possible. So what do we see? What do patients complain about with this? One, they might have spontaneous bleeding. They complain of deep jaw pain, sometimes waking up with blood on their pillow. It's remarkable how loose these teeth become and how quickly they become. But it is a marker of severe immune deterioration. Um, our colleague, Michael Glick, did a study with Brian Musica several years ago, again, before there was um, any retroviral therapy, and he found that necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis was a marker of severe immune deterioration. Put simply, if you show up with a condition like this and the patient shows up with a condition like this in their mouth, you know that they're HIV positive, you know that something systemic is going on as well. So we do our part. We'll start our treatment, which would be getting the most impacted areas numb and then doing a gentle debridement. It's almost like a, a leaching because the tissue is so friable, but you're actually doing a gentle debridement. We put them on a chlorhexidine rinse twice a day for two weeks. We actually go after a gram negative, so we're using something like metronidazole. Um, we'll write that for three times a day. The issue with metronidazole, if a patient has a problem with alcohol, with drinking, it's very important that you don't write this because they'll end up in the hospital. The other alternative you can write is something like Augmentin, which is amoxicillin, um, a penicillin-based antibiotic, which is very good. The only problem we run into there is if they're allergic to amoxicillin. So in those cases, we would need to write clindamycin. The issue with clindamycin is it can cause some severe GI distress. Um, we, did, uh, we do antimicrobial stewardship in my program. We look at uh, five, patient, five um, cases per provider every month, and we check to see if antibiotics were written were one, well documented, two needed, and three were the right thing. And the reason we started this was that there was a surgeon who used to work in my program who thought it was okay to write clindamycin for every patient because they would have better outcomes. And he managed to put two people in the hospital. This was a long time ago. So we want to be careful with what we write for any of our patients. So again, it's a de uh, gentle debridement, chlorhexidine rinses, an appropriate um, antimicrobial such as metronidazole or Augmentin. Um, do your Best to get them stabilized at this point. Make sure they have a follow-up with their HIV care provider because something else is going on with this patient population. And then after that two weeks, bring them in for your deep cleaning. So you'll do your scaling and root planing two quadrants at a time on this patient population. It's amazing how effective the antibiotic chlorhexidine together are in helping to control some of the symptoms. It's also important to make sure that patients are getting proper nutrition because a lot of times people who have this condition with this deep jaw pain truly are having a hard time eating. And so that becomes an issue. So we actually uh, have some mechanical soft foods that are available for our patients who show up who are out of care, haven't been in care, and show up with necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis. We also use it when we're doing full mouth extractions just to make sure that our patients have something to eat prior to taking their medications. But because our goal 
as oral health providers, as primary care providers, is to help our patients have undetectable viral load. So one, they live to a nice old age, like many of my patients are these days, and two, that they can maintain um, good uh, health outcomes. So this is a case of a rapidly advancing periodontal disease in a 26-year-old male. So you can see that the level of bone destruction in a case like this is marked and not something that I don't see this very often anymore, but something that I used to see far too often. Um, this patient did not live six months after I saw them to try to get them cleaned up. Luckily, those days are gone. So now what do we have? Let's look at some of the oral ulcers that are out there. And so these are O'Hara training slides. This was the Oral HIV AIDS Research Alliance that was funded by um, the oral dental branch of the NIH. Um, when you have lesions, recurrent lesions that show up on hard palate or fixed or keratinized tissue, think HSV, think herpes. If you have, here's this another example of this. And these lesions tend to be recurrent. They have mild to moderate pain. And it can show up several times a year. And I think that's important. And we'll go, why? Because we need to be able to simply differentiate between what a herpetic ulcer is and what an aphthous ulcer is. Because a large portion of our population, not HIV positive individuals, but general population present with herpetic infections on a routine basis, and aphthous ulcers. Aphthous is sort of uh, interesting because it tends to show up during tomato season. It tends to show up during stressful times, like when you're taking finals or maybe you're preparing your taxes or, or whatever the reason. This shows up as a ulcer with a gray-yellow pseudomembrane and an area of inflammation around it. Again, aphthous ulcers are recurrent. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is that we have a new disease out there, monk, not a new disease, but a disease that is hitting the states, which normally it would not. Um, when we're talking about monkeypox, you might see a single ulcer in the mouth. How would you differentiate? Because when you biopsy ulcers, you tend to get back the same result. Uh, inflammation, necrotic tissue, blah, blah, but no really definitive diagnosis. So the key when you're looking at aphthous ulcers or herpetic ulcers is they tend to be recurrent. If someone shows up with a new ulcer and it's not recurrent, then we need to start putting our thinking cap on and thinking of what else that could be. Um, when I did my last COVID and dentistry talk, I actually put a listing of possible oral manifestations that had been seen in uh, in relation to COVID. And herpetic ulcers were there, aphthous ulcers were there. I think almost every lesion I'm talking about today, with the exception of spinal cell carcinoma um, and oral warts and, and maybe KS, Every other lesion showed up, things that I even had to look up myself. It was like an oral medicine textbook. But here, when we're looking at just simple aphthous ulcers and simple recurrent ulcers, um, if they're recurrent uh, on hard palate, think about um, KS. So I see a question for patients that are H that people with HIV who have comp and have compromised wound healing. If they are diagnosed with necrotizing ulcer periodontitis gingivitis, and if there is scaling that is too aggressive, is there a chance of them developing osteonecrosis? Complex question, but a very good question that I see in the box. Um, the answer is really no. We're gonna, if we have somebody that has necrotizing ulcer periodontitis, um, you know, we go in stages on that. If you have somebody who really needs, um, intense scaling and root planing, we, the only time we worry about healing is when the absolute neutrophil count is very low. It's under 500. That makes it more difficult for lesions to heal. Another thing that would help with that, that impacts healing is actually uncontrolled diabetes. But for HIV, no, you can go at it. You can treat your necrotizing ulcer periodontitis like I've mentioned before. 
Um, I don't know what too aggressive scaling can be. I mean, I, I think we just get what we need to get out of there. But no, I don't think you'll see osteonecrosis. So, great question. And thank you for making me think. I, I like questions. It, it makes the talk go by a little bit faster. And speaking of which, this is my least favorite um, di diagnosis or classification. Ulcer not otherwise specifi specified or UNOS. And to be frankly honest, I, I call this ulcer that you weren't that people just gave up on and didn't look to see what the cause is, because there is a cause for these. Has anyone noticed bone loss around implants in patients with HIV? Brandon, that's a great question, too. From all the research that we have today, people with HIV have the same exact outcomes on implants as do people who don't have HIV. So there should not be reduced bone loss just based on HIV status. Remember, this is not like a neutropenic person, that a cancer therapy person that's going to have a hard time healing. People with HIV do heal pretty well. So what about this ulcer or not otherwise specified, or I call it sort of lazy? So it's showing up on keratinized tissue. It has a gray yellow membrane. But remember, APTA shows up on non-keratinized tissue. Herpetic ulcers don't tend to look like this, and this was not a recurrent ulcer. So what could this possibly be? So before I go into that, so what we do, and like I said, if you biopsy this lesion, you'll get back necrotic tissue, you'll get back areas of inflammation, and it really won't give you an idea as to how best to address it. Now, I am blessed. I work in a program where I have the electronic medical record and the electronic dental record working together so we can give the best information. So I have the latest labs. I know what their absolute neutrophil count is, their hemoglobin, hematocrit, platelets. I have every lab from a CBC and differential. I have their viral load, their CD4 count, although neither one of those are important when it comes to dental treatment. There are no differences in outcomes. This ulcer it's actually a neutropenic ulcer. The patient had a very low white count. They were on a medication, actually Bactrim, which made their white count drop significantly, and this large ulcer started. So we noticed the drop in the white count. We noticed the medication that the patient was on. We contacted a primary care provider, and we said, we need to take this patient off of this medication and put them on something else to prevent pneumocystis pneumonia because we need to get the white count up for this to heal. So I hope that is a little bit interesting, but maybe not as interesting as the next case I'm going to discuss. We received a call from the attending office who wasn't this person's primary care provider. It was a 49, the individual was a 49 year old Caucasian male his CD4 count, remember, really doesn't matter, except you might see more oral lesions when the CD4 count is less than 200, was 92. His viral load was undetectable, so we took that part out of what could be a possible cause. His white count was significant enough that he was not neutropenic, and his platelet count was high. Not high, high, but you know, it was normal, 184. His chief complaint was mouth pain. It was 10 on a 0 to 10 scale. So when I look at the consult case, I see the tongue. There's ulcers on keratinized tissue. The first thing I think about is herpetic. You can see that there are lesions in the middle of the tongue. You can see the lesion on the side of the tongue, and you know how uncomfortable this is just by looking at it. Then we looked at the soft tissues and intraoral, although it's hard to see, at the, if you look at the maxillary dentulous arch, you can see on the, um, the non-keratinized tissue, there are also ulcers. And so now I'm thinking, well, we have aphthys. And sometimes you do see a combination. Herpetic ulcers, we treat with a antiviral. It could be some of the newer agents, Valtrex, et cetera, or it could be a cyclovir that works perfectly fine as well. And so, with aphthys, if we need to treat it, we use a topical steroid. If you put a topical steroid to a person who has herpetic ulcers, it's like putting gasoline on a fire. And so in this case, 
what we would do was we would start the patient on the antiviral on day one because we have ulcers on both intraoral uh, non-keratinized tissue and, and intraoral keratinized tissue. And then on the next day, follow it up with uh, a steroid. Uh, in this case, it would be a systemic steroid. And that's exactly what we did. However, when I looked at the rest of the patient, I saw basically what was a hole in his chin. I also saw what appeared to be angular chelitis and another hole in his chin. And my first thought was, well, this is most likely going to be out of my league. What could this possibly be? But I was the only expert there with the attending. So we cultured we did blood work. We looked for certain things. As I mentioned, we treated with a cyclovir to start, then prednisone taper. Um, there was a medication. I'm not sure if it's still out there. Gel Claire, which is like an oral bandage. Percocet, because the patient was in pain. And ketoconazole cream for overclosing or whatever was causing the angular colitis on the patient. We did a bacterial culture, HSV was negative, bacterial culture it had staph. There was really nothing that was specific about what we were seeing. We looked for histoplasma antigen, we did CBC platelets differential and an RPR. RPR was positive, so that person actually had syphilis. There were some signs of cognitive decline. So the patient was di actually diagnosed with neurosyphilis. He was successfully treated with IV penicillin in the hospital for four days, and he was released on IV IM procaine penicillin plus probenicid. So this was a case where the attending had to call me up for my two cents, and then I had to help the attending figure out what to do. And together, we actually were able to work with this patient. Um, I made a denture for this patient. Um, we actually helped diagnose his uh, uh, friend of his who was also HIV infected and also had syphilis. So this ended up being quite the case, although a long time ago, we still see cases like this. So what about human papillomavirus, the most transmitted STI we have in the country these days? It's getting lots of attention. But the most important thing I can say about it is we have a vaccine for this, a proven vaccine for this that can prevent getting cancer based on the prevalence, on, on the, on the uh, fact that the person has HPV pre uh, uh, in, the, in the oral cavity. So using vaccines or talking to our patients about vaccination is important. You can actually get vaccinated up to the age of 45. Uh, regretfully, I missed that cutoff too. But it's the cause of oral warts. Oral warts are not oncogenic. They don't cause cancer. They can be single. They can be multiple. When we did our study looking at this, we did a nested case control study. So for every patient that had a ward, we matched them with two patients of similar demographics, viral load, et cetera, et cetera, that did not. And what we found is it didn't matter on gender. It didn't matter on race. It didn't matter on ethnicity. It didn't matter on mode of transmission. What we found in my patient population, I work at a hospital, so these are the sicker of the patients at the time. What we noticed was that they had a they were newly on therapy and had a one log reduction in viral load. So the medications were working, the new CD4 cells were forming, and they were naive to HPV, so they were basically overreacting. So oral warts are not oncogenic, and they are treatable, but they're very recurrent. They tend to come back. So again, here's a case of an oral wart due to HPV showing up on the tissue. It can be cauliflower, it can be raised, there can be some that are flat. Um, this was a patient who contacted me off of HIV dent, which I thought was sort of interesting. He had had two laser procedures. Now, I will be frankly honest, the, I'm glad we're taking um, airborne transmission so seriously because HPV can live in an aerosol. And so that's one of my big concerns. So we try not to use the laser on HPV. This patient actually had laser treatment twice on the area and really was trying to find another means of, of treatment because the lesions were recurrent. They kept on showing up. So I use cryosurgery. 
Um, I actually used to share this this um, device with the women's clinic. There is not a cryosurge unit that is made for the oral cavity. I just had to reorder my unit um, after a good 25 years, 24 years of using it. Um, so you actually place it directly onto the lesion. You get a good solid freeze. And then it's not the freezing that actually kills the lesions. It's the defrosting. So there are some agents, things that we can buy. There are a histo freezer. There's some different products that are on the market where you too can do cryotherapy if you see a lesion like that and don't need to invest $1,000 into a cryo search unit. But I'm basically known now as Dr. Freeze, and my Mondays are normally spent freezing oral warts. So it's something that we're still seeing a great deal of. This was a case, a pretreatment case of a patient that I had who had pretty significant oral warts and pretty significant coverage of where these lesions were presenting. I did cryosurge using the unit, and this is what we were able to achieve. So we were literally able to clean up all of the oral warts and get this person back to living a, a good, healthy uh, life because it's sort of hard to go around like this and have a job or have any kind of relations or anything of that sort. So we were literally able to treat and get this person uh, with a better oral health related quality of life, more desire to stay on their medications, more desire to stay away from um, illicit substances. So human papillomavirus in the oral cavity of HIV patients is not reduced by initiating any retroviral therapy. And this was pretty remarkable because we know how effective and how quickly any retroviral therapy reduces the HIV viral load. But this was a study done by Caroline Chavosky and others. It was published in the journal AIDS. Amongst 388 participants, 18% had at least one HPV genotype present before initiating antiretroviral therapy, and 24% had at least one genotype present after 12 to 24 weeks of antiretroviral therapy. So the results suggest that effective immune control of human papillomavirus in the oral cavity of people with HIV is not reconstituted in six months. And I think that's important, which is why for a significant period of time, I am Dr. Freeze for some of these patients because they're my patients. A lot of them come in very late, very sick. We get them on therapy and then we get some parts of immune reconstitution syndrome. Now, it's actually sort of interesting that we don't think that these oral warts are directly related to immune reconstitution. We still are looking at why we're seeing more of these. The prevalence of HPV-associated oral malignancies is something that we need to keep our eye on and something that I'll talk about in, an issue, in, in, in a few minutes. Now, the study population that Dr. Shabosky looked at is different than my patient population, and they did not see an increase in oral warts, whereas in my patient population, we do. The difference is you had to have an AIDS diagnosis to come into my clinic, whereas the oral um, AIDS Research Center at UCSF, it could be anybody of, of any um, CD4 count. So we have changed our, our rules now. We want to have a more mixed population. But at Grady's um, Infectious Disease Program, we are already following 6,000 people with HIV two-thirds of which have an AIDS diagnosis. So we have a sicker population. And our number of new cases presenting is one of the highest in the country, regrettably. Risk for oral HPV-related oral cancer sores in U.S. men. High-risk oral HPV infections were higher amongst men compared to women, 7.3% versus 1.4%. Prevalence of human papillomavirus 16, which increases the risk for oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, is six-fold greater in men when compared to women. Oral HPV infection prevalence was about 30% amongst men with 16 greater or equal to 16 lifetime oral sexual partners, 18.2% amongst men who reported having sex with men, 
and 19.3% among men with concurrent genital HPV infection. Could be same source. Overall, oral HPV prevalence was 11.5% in men and 3.2% in women. Oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma is now the most common HPV-associated cancer in the United States, according to a new report from the CDC. The transition happened because cervical uh, uh, carcinoma incidence rates have decreased for multiple reasons. One, uptake of the vaccine, and oropharyngeal squamous cell incidence has increased to 2.7% per year amongst men, and 0.8% amongst women. Again, a good reason to make sure you do a comprehensive soft tissue exam on every patient that we see. The uptick in posterior oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma could be due in part to changing sexual behaviors, including unprotected oral sex, especially amongst white men, who report having the highest number of sexual partners and performing oral sex at a younger age compared with other racial or ethnic groups. This is according to the study. So now, oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma includes those at the base of the tongue, pharyngeal tonsils, anterior and posterior tonsillar pillars, et cetera, et cetera. So these are posterior oropharyngeal lesions. However, I've diagnosed it on the lateral borders of the tongue. I've diagnosed it on gingival tissue. So if you have an unusual looking area, don't hesitate to either do the biopsy or refer the biopsy. HPV vaccination can prevent infection with HPV types most strongly associated with cancer, which is why I'm so proactive about talking to people about getting this HPV vaccination. The other thing that's important is that there's this sort of thought out there, if you get HPV vaccination when you're young, that you'll be more likely to have sex. Well, that's not the case. Uh, looking at studies, if you've had the vaccine or you not had the vaccine, there's no difference. So ongoing surveillance of HPV-associated cancers using high-quality population-based registries is very critical so we can monitor the increase or decrease or where we are actually at. Squamous cell carcinoma, and that is something that I am regretfully seeing. I recently lost a patient who I diagnosed 12 years ago. He did live 12 years. Um, but if I could have had him vaccinated before the age of, of 45, the last 12 years of his life would have been much better. People with HIV have increased incidence of many types of malignancies and those including the oral cavity. The most common type of oral cancer in the general population is in the posterior oral cancer is squamous cell carcinoma, which accounts for 90% of all oral cancers. Squamous cell carcinoma usually presents in the posterior oropharynx or the base or the lateral borders of the tongue. And here you can see a couple of pictures where you do see a non-healing ulcer that was present for an extended period of time. So if you have a non-healing ulcer present for an extended period of time, um, I would normally biopsy these, but I would do an incisional biopsy. I now refer them to my colleagues in oral surgery so they can do an excisional uh, biopsy. They can get a uh, staining done right away to see if it's related to cancer and refer them to the oncology team right away. Whereas if I did a, a partial biopsy, then they'd still have to go in and get the, the lesion removed and still go on chemotherapy or radiation therapy. So the landscape of oral malignancy is changing in the general population as well as in the patient population I've served all these years. Risk sectors for squamous cell have traditionally been um, smoking and drinking. And so one of the favorite questions I normally ask in a lecture is, okay, what's more common, getting a posterior oral pharyngeal cancer due to too much smoking and drinking or human papillomavirus? And still more people say too much smoking and drinking, where the answer is human papillomavirus. So again, this is the HIV Dental Alliance. We've been around for 25 years. Uh, we've expanded the site. All the pictures and probably several hundred more are on the site. Information on dental treatment, oral manifestations, and the latest information that's actually taking place. Like today is actually the opening of, of the International Conference AIDS 2022. 
So it's time for questions, and I see a question that has popped up. As a general dentist treating a patient diagnosed with HIV, if they are taking their HIV meds as directed, going to their MD for blood work every three months, that's a little excessive. It really should be about every six months now. What other labs besides absolute neutral count and platelet count are we concerned with for invasive procedures? None. I mean, that was the simplest answer. It's a fabulous question. It's a question that always comes up. But uh, they don't have to go every three months. Now we're having some patients who are doing so well, they literally only come in on once a year. Um, but part of our guidelines for Ryan White programs is seeing them twice a year. So the really, we want to find out platelet counts. We don't see nearly as much idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura as we did excuse me, back in the day, but we still have patients who present with that. We still have some patients who present with absolute, uh, uh, excuse me, a low absolute neutrophil count. So great questions. People with healing issues tend to be uncontrolled diabetics, and we're seeing an increase in the number of diabetics who also have HIV disease. So I don't know if there are any other questions out there. Corinne, do we have anything else? Uh, not right now. I think maybe let's give it a few minutes. If anyone has any additional questions, you can put them in the have a question box on your control panel. I just highlighted on your screen. Also, just a reminder for everyone, if you do want to receive CE credit for tonight's webinar, please click on the CE available icon. All right. We have some questions coming in. So, Clara, you, 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 you're making me work, and I greatly appreciate that. What are the most common side effects of the newer HIV meds? That is a great question because unlike the previous meds, which might lead to things like buffalo hump or fat redistribution or remarkable xerostomia, I mean, where the patients were literally just sort of locked, They're, they were so dry. I, I used to think that I, I'm putting on a rubber dam, but why? Because there is absolutely no saliva. I was doing it for safety reasons. So the five side effects of the new medications, which are now one pill once a day for many people, are minimal at best. Maybe some GI effects at the beginning, getting used to new medication, but they really, their side effects are minimal. And then uh, Dr. Severin says, as an expert in this field, what are my initial thoughts on monkeypox? Honestly, my initial thought on monkeypox um, is, oh my Lord, not another infectious disease. Um, <laughs> I started my career as a private practice dentist, and then I had patients showing up who no one else would treat with HIV. And so I thought one, um, one very deadly at the time infectious disease was enough for any one dental person to take on. And then we all ended up having to deal with COVID. So that was infectious disease number two. Um, monkeypox is something that we were seeing in Western Africa. There are two different clades of monkeypox, the one that we're seeing in the United States and Western Europe at the present time is the non-lethal form. Um, again, it's new and it's spreading pretty rapidly in the United States. Presently, it's limited. Only now we're diagnosing it limited to men who have sex with men because they're showing up to sexual transmitted disease clinics or health departments because of where some of the lesions are presenting. And these are can be little pustules or little ulcerations with a dark little hole in the middle. Um, it is not sexually transmitted. It is not airborne at this point in time. We don't think that's the case, but remember, we're already taking airborne precautions because of COVID. So I don't care what disease or disease you don't have, um, I'm going to make sure we have fit tested N95s available and all of the pops, all the PPE that we need. So my initial thoughts are we're at the very beginning of this. Um, the WHO has called it uh, 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 an epidemic and it was something of note. Um, it hasn't quite happened. That's not a public health emergency yet in the United States. But remember when HIV first started, the risk factors were being men who have sex with men and uh, IV drug users and Haitians. It was the most bizarre thing that 
Haitians were being of Haitian descent or being from Haiti was a risk factor. But we know that that's not the truth. And so if you come into contact with these lesions on skin, and not just gradual contact, not like shaking hands or something like that, but you're at a club and you come into contact with somebody at skin for a significant period of time, chances are you're going to contact this, contract this because it is contagious. Um, and right now we have a vaccine for it. The problem is we don't have enough of the vaccine. So the government has some in, in stockpiles that they're distributing out, but you can go through 200 vaccines. If you say that you're vaccinating for this population at say Fulton County Health Department, you can literally go through that vaccine in an hour or two. Considering the large segment of the adult population boomers, I'm one of those, opposing a challenge for the health workforce as they age and keep their natural dentition, can you comment on HIV incidence treatment as they impact the care of older adults? That is actually another excellent question. Um, one at a time. Um, and Helene has made a comment that the New England Journal of Medicine has a great article in the section of oral manifestations of monkeypox. But let's go back to this large segment of the adult population posing a challenge for the health workforce as they age. Um, I will basically say that we're having people age longer. We're having to do some heroic things to try to save teeth, but it's, it's just the same. If the patient has dry mouth and they look like they need a prescription fluoride, we hand it out. We give it to our patients. We write prescriptions, but we give it to our patients. If they're, the biggest thing we worry about is xerostomia, um, root caries, things of that sort. So we have to address those kinds of symptoms and wear, natural wear and tear as the patient population gets older. And um, are we saying older and 60 and above? Mm, I'm not clear about that. Still, um, we, we do everything. We have a great hygiene department because prevention is number one. That's how we maintain all the work. I always say the, the, the most valuable resource we have is our time. And so I don't want to be retreating something over and over again because they have xerostomia, because they can't floss between the area. So what we do is we're very aggressive in our preventive care to make sure that you can maintain as many teeth as possible, just like the general patient population. There is also some information back to Gary's question on monkeypox from the CDC. It's an excellent source. It will talk about risk factors, how to avoid getting um, exposed to monkeypox. It's actually some pretty good information there as well. Are there more questions? Yep, it looks like we have yeah. two more. What is your, I'm going in order here, what is your protocol for treating people with HIV, whoops, I'm sorry, People with HIV in general, any procedure you are recommend not to perform an order, not to harm the patient? Okay, another great question. There was a study done um, by Michael Glick and Steve Abel in the, about 1994, I believe it was published, and they found there was really no difference in outcomes when you're treating an, a person with HIV compared to treating a person who didn't have HIV. And that study was before we have these wonderful therapies that we have today. So we do implants in this patient population. We do oral surgery in this patient population. We do not premedicate. The only time we premedicate on this patient population is if their absolute neutrophil count is 500 or below. The name of the app that was stating at the beginning of the webinar, you know, that is a great question and add me, is actually HIV oral diseases. Thank you for getting back to the slide, Corinne. It's uh, HIV oral diseases. It's free. Nobody makes any money based on this thing. It's just sharing information. Uh, my whole goal is to get information so we can treat our medically complex patient population. And as the as the boomers grow older, we're going to be managing more people that have uh, that are medically complex. So let's see. I got to thank you. And 
discriminatory to not provide necessary care based on HIV. I, I, I don't think the question was about that. I think the question is, are any risk factors that are any procedures that you would not perform based on a, a feeling that maybe there is something that would have a bad outcome? And I'd like to go at it from the study perspective. We haven't seen anything different. I have been an active clinician in this field for years. Um, now I actually oversee a residency program that treats this patient population. I'm so proud of the work that they do. They've learned to understand what the labs mean. They understand that the stigma associated with this disease, regretfully the stigma that's going to be uh, seen with uh, what uh, Gary Severn brought up, monkeypox, um, there used to be stigma about having breast cancer back in the day. And we got to stop stigmatizing diseases and treat everybody with the care, concern, and humanity that you would want your own family to be treated in. Anymore. I, I think I that wraps up our Q&A se <laughs> session. <laughs> <laughs> well, always fun, always fun. Um, it's always a pleasure to be able to present to an engaged audience, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Resnick, and thank you to everyone for the interest in tonight's webinar topic and all of the great questions that were asked. I'd also like to thank Dr. Resnick once again for sharing his time and expertise with us tonight, and thank you all for attending. Have a great night, everyone. We hope to see you on future webinars. Good night. Thank you.